Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna kick us off, um, start just by welcoming everyone on behalf of the Equality Caucus. Um, always great to do these briefings and it turns out to be particularly important to do this briefing, not just on the anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, but also coming on the heels of some exciting policy changes, um, which I know some of our panelists will, will talk about in some more depth. Um, on behalf of the caucus, we have Laura and Ben joining us. Um, Laura will be handling logistics. If you have questions, you can post any questions in the chat. We'll come back to the chat box at the end of our briefing. Um, the, way we'll, well, the way we'll move through the briefing is we'll start by hearing from Undersecretary Jones, and then the rest of our panelists will rejoin and we'll, we'll have each of them talk about their own perspectives and experiences. So we're, we're really pleased to have Honorable Gina Ortiz-Jones, the Undersecretary of the Air Force joining us today. She is a friend of the caucus and we were so excited to see her get confirmed into this role. Uh, as many of you probably know, she is the first out lesbian to serve as an Undersecretary of a military branch and the first woman of color to hold the position that she holds. And we're just really pleased that she could join us. And let me turn it over to you, Undersecretary, uh, would be um, we'd be happy to have you speak as long as you're available. Great. Well, thanks, Sean. Um, so, well, with that invitation, I've only got like a 45 minutes each plan. Perfect. So, I'm just kidding. Um, I uh, I want to thank you, Sean, and, and your team for putting this together. This is such a special day. Um, and I'm actually at our uh, the Air Force has a convention each year. It's called the Air Force uh, Association Convention. And um, so I'm, making, I'm, I'm stepping aside uh, to, to do this because this is so important to me. I think um, I, I want to say thanks, not only for putting this together, but also I know there's a number of staffers that are on that are participating in this call. Um, many of the staffers uh, that were so critical potentially in getting Don't Ask Don't Tell the field and are going to be so critical moving forward as we also get um, uh, have some additional changes uh, to ensure that uh, certainly our LGBTQ members can serve to their, to their, soul, their full potential. So. I want to thank you. Um, and I was asked to share just a little bit about um, kind of my experience in serving under Don't Ask, Don't Tell and how that's shaped um, how I view uh, the awesome responsibility that I have uh, in helping to lead the Department of the Air Force, which includes the Air Force and the Space Force, and of course, ensuring uh, that all service members, and in particular LGBTQ service members, can serve to their full potential. Um, I, uh, I actually, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, for me, started when I was a, a cadet. And uh, it was a four-year Air Force ROTC scholarship that took me from San Antonio to Boston University. Uh, and I was very excited to be there. Uh, but one of the very first things I had to do was sign a piece of paper that said, I will not engage in homosexual behavior uh, because Don't Ask, Don't Tell applied to me even as a cadet. So it became very clear to me that you know, my, uh, my opportunity to get an education, my opportunity to serve our country, my opportunity to die for our country, if need be, all of that goes away. Uh, just because at the time we didn't have leaders with the courage, with the courage to say anybody ready and willing to serve their country should have the opportunity to do so. And so um, now as the 27th Undersecretary of the Air Force, I keep that experience with me. Um, and I think about it every single day about the awesome responsibility I have now to be the type of leader that I wish I had when I was serving. And uh, the, the, the need to make sure that we've got policies uh, that ensure, again, our, our, uh, all service members can serve to their full potential is so critical and as important as any other thing that we do as a, as a department. Um, on Friday, uh, understanding we due to COVID restrictions, and again, we had the convention today, um, I asked my team to, to gather some folks uh, for a, at least a picture in the Pentagon. Um, and I really wanted to bring folks together that had served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I thought that'd be a nice photo. And I was so pleasantly surprised to, to show up to the, to the courtyard. And I, I'm looking at folks and I'm like, oh man, these folks, these folks, some of these folks look really young. Uh, and my team told me that the vast majority of folks that showed up for the photo actually signed up because Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And so that really warmed my heart because what that shows is that they knew they could now serve. They decided to serve because they, because they knew with the repeal that they could serve to their full potential. They could bring their full selves to the mission, right? None of these stupid pronoun games, none of this, you know, 
uh, you know, um, obfuscating what you did on, on the weekend, but bring your full self to, to the mission. And so I'm ecstatic about where we are. I'm ecstatic about where we are going. Uh, we obviously have uh, some work to do though. Um, and, uh, but I think again, with the right leadership, certainly this administration, certainly the, the leadership at the department and within the department of the Air Force is committed to make sure that we've got policies again, focused on ensuring everyone can serve to their full potential. I've said that three or four times now, so you know, uh, we are serious about this and this continues to drive our, our every day. Um, I think it's uh, important that we talk about the role of, of policies because our policies in effect communicate how we value somebody's service, right? Whether we mean to or not, our policies, how we scope them, how we enforce them, whether we enforce them, um, speaks to how we value one's service. Um, and so whether you're talking about preventing sexual assault or harassment, whether you're talking about making sure we've got adequate childcare, whether you're talking about addressing the racial and gender disparities in our service or that affect one's quality of service, or whether you're talking about preventing the harassment of our trans service members uh, due to outdated military records that use their dead name or that misgender them. These are all things that affect our readiness because what those do is they detract from our service members ability again to serve to their full potential. And I'm committed to making sure uh, that we have a Department of the Air Force that uh, that is tuned to, again, what we need, certainly operationally, but also how do we ensure that everyone knows um, they've got a place in our department um, if they're ready and willing to work hard. And I know they are. So I wanted to uh, just share again a little bit of my experiences, how I'm thinking about this, how I am so thankful uh, for the caucuses in, in bringing us together to this day on this very important commemoration. And uh, we know we've got, again, a lot of work to do, but I'm thankful of the ways in which David and Dixon and Joseph and, and Bree here at the Department of the Air Force are working toward, um, toward making sure that uh, the administration um, continues to implement um, sound policies to ensure that uh, we've got um, a team that is going to move us in the right direction. So thank you so much for doing this, Sean. Um, I hope you all have a great discussion and I look forward to, uh, to seeing y'all maybe next year. Take care. Thank you so much, Undersecretary. We really appreciate your time. So I'll have our other panelists come back on video and unmute themselves and then we will or I guess come back on video and I'll do some quick intros. It looks like people are joining back in. So again, a reminder to participants, you can put a question if you have one in the chat box, um, and we'll monitor those and we'll come back to those at the end. Um, let me introduce, I'll introduce all four of our panelists in a row and then have them speak. So we'll start with Dixon Osborne. Dixon is the co was the co-founder and executive director of Service Members Legal Defense Network, and recently released his book, Mission Possible, The Story of Repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So perfect timing for that. Um, next, we'll hear from Captain Joseph Rocha, who was, who was targeted by the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy when he was serving in the United States Marine Corps and is now working as an attorney. Uh, next, we'll hear from Staff Sergeant of the Air Force, David Hall, who's now working with UNHCR, also someone impacted by the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. And last, we'll hear from Lieutenant Colonel in the US Space Force, Bree Fram, who's also the president of one of the other advocacy groups that we work with, advocacy group known as Sparta. So they'll go in order, and at the end, we'll have time for some questions and answers. Um, so let me go ahead and hand it over to you, um, Dixon, to kick us off. Hey, thank you so much, Sean, and it's an honor to be with everybody here today. Uh, I thought I would focus sort of on the policy and politics of repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We have distinguished panelists here who can talk about their personal stories that were so impactful. And in fact, the, the telling of the stories of those who are impacted by Don't Ask, Don't Tell had such an important uh, impact. But my journey started back in 1993 uh, when uh, Bill Clinton first promised that he would lift the ban on gays in the military, which was just a regulation that could be controlled by the Secretary of Defense or the president. And uh, it then got taken over by Congress and codified into a statute. Uh, and the question is, how do you, uh, one, launch an organization when it's at the most unpopular point possible to try to repeal uh, a law? 
uh, now you just had uh, you know, a bipartisan majority in Congress uh, support uh, you know, codifying a ban on known gay people uh, that was supported by the Pentagon, uh, including individuals like General Colin Powell, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who walked onto the steps of the Pentagon to talk about how many people were calling in opposing gay people serving openly, and the president uh, has signed it. Uh, and the only way that you can really uh, try to change a law is either because the courts are going to repeal it or declare it's unconstitutional or you know, Congress will repeal it. And at the beginning in 1993, there was some hope that the courts would come to the rescue because there were a couple of cases in the pipeline uh, that had been victorious. Uh, and people may remember uh, Colonel Margareta Kamemeyer uh, challenged uh, the old ban, one was reinstated. Uh, Petty Officer Keith Meinhold challenged the old ban. One was reinstated. They both served openly for a number of years. Uh, but when it came to the new law, uh, the courts uh, all unanimously said, in cases filed by SLDN and by uh, Lambda and ACLU, that uh, who were they to step in when there was agreement among all the various branches of government? Uh, you know, my view was that's exactly what this the courts are supposed to do is to, to uh, rule on the constitutionality of the laws. But we realized, my co-founder, Michelle Benneke, and I realized early on that there had to be a long-term sustained political effort to try to uh, repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And a lot of that, of course, was the storytelling. We provided legal services. We tried to provide service members a fighting chance against this horrific law. Um, it was sold as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It sounded like it was something benign, uh, but in fact, the same barriers to service existed. The same reasons for discharge existed. Uh, there were promises in the regulations that you could go to gay bars, you could read gay magazines, you could hang out with gay friends and march in pride parades. But then there was a footnote saying, but if we do discharge you for these reasons or if we press criminal charges, you have no basis to challenge it. So there was you no know, a exception that just swallowed any kind of protections that they tried to provide. So over the course, uh, I'll do sort of the sweeping 17 year view here. Um, there were some pivotal moments that, that helped turn the tide on it. Now, part of it, of course, was the, the service members and their stories themselves that shocked the conscience. One of the big ones that I think was the first sort of seismic event was the murder of Private First Class Barry Winchell at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, that sort of shook, I think, the American conscience to realize this was not a benign policy. This was a very malignant policy that could cost people their lives. Um, it also shook up the Pentagon. Uh, we had warned the Pentagon in our very first annual report in 1995 on how the law was getting implemented, that if they didn't take harassment seriously, they were going to have a murder on their hands. And unfortunately, um, our prediction came true. But that event led... Bill Clinton had issued an executive order on hate crimes in the military uh, 10 years before Congress acted on hate crimes. Uh, and it led the, the Pentagon to develop the most comprehensive set of anti-harassment regulations up to that point. Uh, and there was training from the service chiefs all the way down. And I would suggest that uh, had we not dealt with the anti-gay climate in the armed forces, uh, we would not have been ready for repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell even in 2010. That was a, a, a necessary predicate for us to get to repeal. Other events that I think were important, um, there's an individual, Gary Gates, a sociologist who cr crunched the numbers in the 2000 census trying to determine how many gay people were in the armed forces. And he was able to do that by cross-tabulating and concluded that there were 60,000 LGB transgender individuals were not included in that estimate, 60,000 that were serving in, on active duty or in the reserves, and there, there were 1 million uh, gay veterans in the country. I mean, this sort of blew open this notion that gays never served, that, uh, that the Pentagon was effective in kicking everybody out. Uh, and it was important with individuals like General Shalash Kashvili, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs that succeeded Pal, who asked me, no, Dixon, I can see why repeal is good for the gays, but why is it good for the army? And that's like, sir, it's because you're commanding 60,000 people uh, and the issue is not whether we are serving, it is how do you treat us? How do you make sure that the units are functioning at the highest level? So the data was important. 
then 9-11 occurred. And the story of the Arabic linguist really came to symbolize the stupidity of don't ask, don't tell. Uh, there was a critical shortage of language specialists uh, who spoke Arabic and they were kicking them out for being gay. And so you had politicians really starting to come forward saying, this is just the height of inanity. We are shooting ourselves in the foot with this policy. Another event was uh, we orchestrated the coming out of two retired generals and a retired admiral uh, who were gay. Again, sort of blowing open this notion that LGBT service members had not served at the highest levels with great distinction. Um, this all then helped you know, in the pivot toward uh, moving from, a, uh, from just legal advocacy to going back into Congress. And we crafted a bill called the Military Readiness Enhancement Act that Marty Meehan introduced first in 2005 uh, and accompanied that with lobby days. And I got reintroduced again in 2007 and then the final one in 2009, uh, which was amended. And then it got stripped from the defense bill and as a standalone bill. Uh, so all these events helped, I think, create an environment where in 2009, we were ready for repeal. I had a conversation with Brian Bond, who was uh, the liaison, the LGBT liaison for the White House at the time. He was like, how do we do this? And we were sitting in Lafayette Park in front of the statue uh, of Baron von Steuben, who is reportedly the gay Prussian uh, advisor to General Washington and armed forces. Uh, and I said, don't have Obama lead. You need to have Admiral Mike Mullen and Secretary of Defense Gates out there in front. Because if you have this being led by the Pentagon, it makes it much harder for Congress to reject. And it opens up the ability for other uh, military officials to come in and support. And so in February uh, 2010, you had Admiral Mullen and Gates testifying before the Senate. And Mullen put it very well, he said, after deep reflection, he said, this is a matter of integrity, both for the individual as well as for the institution. We can't have policies that condition service on lying. So we can get into in the Q&A and, and some of the, uh, you know, what happened last year. We can get into some of the litigation strategy in the last couple of years. Uh, but these are some of the, uh, at least a, a selection of the high level events that helped transform a debate where in 1993, 90% of service members opposed case serving openly. The majority of the American public uh, opposed it. And by 2010, uh, you had 78% of the American public supporting a repeal of the policy and 70%, according to the Pentagon study uh, of service members saying they were perfectly fine with gays serving in the military. So let me leave that there and pass the baton on uh, to Captain Rocha. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, Dixon. I really appreciate your presentation. It definitely took me down a nostalgical road uh, and left me a little emotional. I um, appreciate all your hard work on that. Um, so my name is Joseph Rocha. Um, I, like many others, started my military career when I turned 18 years old. Uh, in my case, I, had, I wanted to join the military so bad um, that I had filled out my paperwork when I, turned, when I was 17 and walked in on my 18th birthday to actually sign it because I didn't have parents who would, who would allow me to join at 17. And uh, I had already experienced such a difficult childhood and teenage years. Uh, I wanted nothing more than to be a part of this grand institution and uh, make our country better. Um, so at 18, when thinking about Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I personally had only known I was gay for about a year, if that, actually not even a year. So it was very easy and naive for me to think as actually, you know, Dixon, you know, many of the senators would ask us years later, well, you know, why don't you just not tell and everything will be fine. And I, you know, as an 18 year old, I thought the same thing. I didn't have a partner. I wasn't in love. Uh, I wasn't married. And I thought, this is my career dream. Um, as long as I stay within the lines, I can be successful in this institution and I'll be just fine. Um, that's certainly not what happened, as some of you will know. Um, I, I was chasing the Naval Academy. I was also chasing Iraq and Afghanistan. I wanted to contribute. So as a, I joined the Navy to prove myself to the Academy because I didn't have the math and science skills to go straight to it. 
I wanted to be a Marine Corps officer, but I knew I had to prove myself to the Navy first. So I joined the Navy. I became a military police officer because uh, at the time they were being heavily deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I became a bomb dog handler because obviously our center of gravity was IEDs uh, in those years. Um, long story short, that unit became obsessed with my sexuality because I wouldn't sleep with prostitutes and I wouldn't tell them that I was or was not gay. I was too proud to say no and unwilling to say yes, right? I wanted this career more than anything. So um, ultimately I get accepted to the Naval Academy through the Naval Academy Preparatory School. I get to leave this terrible place where I've served as a 19, 20 year old being hazed for the suspicion of being gay, not even confirmation. Um, and I get to the Naval Academy and you know, part of the indoctrination or the indoc there is that they're describing to you that you know, these are the, the people that you're going to spend the next five years of your life with uh, that are going to know all your secrets, that you are going to baptize each other's children, be in each other's weddings, and serve your entire careers with. And I felt the walls closing in on me. I knew that I had done everything in Bahrain to follow the rules, and still I had ended up in such a, frankly, dangerous space. Um, and I didn't see my way out of the academy, or um, I knew that the longer I stayed in, I'd have more to lose, because I would Rather than being an E4 kicked out for being gay, I would be an O1 being kicked out for being gay or be a, a Naval Academy um, midshipman. So I came out, um, you know, the Academy treated me like any other criminal because of the way that the law was. I went from, you know, living in the building with my peers to picking up trash and vacuuming their gyms for six to eight weeks while they figured out what to do with me. Um, ultimately, the commander of NAPS told me that he had spoken to the Admiral at the Naval Academy and that he had indicated that I could stay so long as I took back what I had said. In the moment, I thought, well, gee, that's awfully big of them. But then I realized it's like insult to injury. Now they were asking me, it was hard enough to come out. Now they were asking me to deny that I was gay officially and in writing. I refused to do that. So, um, you know, during that time, it was during the Bush administration, Rumsfeld, uh, General Peter Pace, who was my icon as the first Marine chairman of the Joint Chiefs had just said that homosexuality was immoral. Um, you know, as Dixon, you've heard a lot in that era, it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when, right? So we were all at just too much risk. Um, how am I on time? Um, so what I did, I came out, they, sent me home. I had enough money to pay for a month's rent and I didn't know what I was going to do after that. Um, you know, the press found me. I was able to become an advocate uh, for several years. And then the federal court challenge that would ultimately rule Don't Ask, Don't Tell Unconstitutional found me. And that's one of my proudest um, achievements is to have been able to be a part of that case where I'm cited as um, Judge Virginia Phillips is um, in her decision as to why it was against the First Amendment. So she decided it was against the first and the fifth, but in my case, the first, because I had to choose between my physical safety as a teenager overseas in uniform and my career. Um, I would go back in to be a Marine Corps officer and a judge advocate and a prosecutor, serve seven more years after repeal. But mind you, you know, especially in this group, I would uh, want to stress that repeal forgot about those who we have to thank for it even happening in the first place. So as Dixon stated, it's, it's veterans making the sacrifices to share their stories that got us to repeal. But the repeal only took in mind people who wanted to come in. It forgot all about us. So it took me an extra year to come back in because I had criminal coding that was in several different systems that don't speak to each other. And I had to do the legwork to undo that, unfortunately. So hopefully, you know, in the future, it's a little better than that. Um, as a prosecutor in the Marine Corps, you know, as the undersecretary mentioned, there's a long way to go. You know, I often had to get, uh, you know, mildly belligerent explaining how a male could be a victim of sexual assault um, and, uh, you know, why their case was credible and why we should prosecute it regardless of X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, you know, it was hit, it was like, Steps forward and steps back. We saw the trans ban take place when I finally was able to serve again, which was 
awful, and, but I was in uniform so I couldn't speak anymore, uh, which is, was a tailspin. Um, you know, the posters that we remember the first year of the Pentagon putting up posters celebrating LGBT month were miraculously gone during the entire Trump administration, or at least I never saw one in North Carolina until uh, I was signing my paperwork to leave the Marine Corps, which happened to be under Biden. Um, so, you know, moving forward, hopefully, you know, LGBT inclusiveness will not be a matter of who is president, but just a matter of DOD policy. Um, you know, not to make anyone feel old, but my junior Marines were eight or seven years old when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, repealed, not even in place. Um, so in a way, that's what we had always dreamed of is that they would know a world where Don't Ask, Don't Tell didn't exist. But at the same time, you know, it's a reminder that uh, we can't take our eye off the ball. Um, and uh, so with that, I will uh, pass the baton. Thank you so much for this tremendous opportunity. Uh, thank you, um, Joseph, and it's good to see you again. I feel like it's been forever <laughs> since I've actually uh, talked to you. And of course, Dixon, it's always great to see you um, and um, Lieutenant Colonel Fram. It's great to also get to be on a panel with you. Um, and then Sean, thanks for inviting me and, and to all of our great guests that are doing all the work um, on the Hill. Um, excited to be here, excited to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of, of the repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And um, so, you know, I went into the military, I think same with um, Joseph, except I did, you know, I did go start college first and then realized I had burned myself out really quickly and was like, you know what, I, I originally wanted to be a doctor and I was like, that is not what I want to be. <laughs> and, and so decided to to join the Air Force as a way to one, figure out what I did want to do, but then also I knew that I could use it to eventually pay for the rest of my college. Yes, you know, my parents um, could not afford to do so. Um, and so I didn't know I was gay, you know, when I hadn't thought about it when I went in, I mean, I probably had inklings because I hadn't really dated um, any women my whole life. Um, but, but when I went in, I didn't think about Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I didn't think about being gay and um, I just went in did my service. I was stationed in um, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia and then um, got stationed up in Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska. Um, I loaded bombs and missiles on F-15s. I excelled um, as an enlisted. You know, I got below the zone. I was distinguished graduate at leadership schools. You know, I and then it came to a point where everyone kept asking me like, why are you not an officer? <laughs> like, we don't understand why you're enlisted. <laughs> and so they, luckily there was a program, a new um, ROTC detachment had just started at the University of Alaska Anchorage and I had already started taking classes. Um, and so then uh, one of my master sergeants said, you know, have you thought about ROTC? Um, and they had a two year program. So they would let me out of my commitment um, and, do two years and then come right back in as an officer. And so then my goal at that point was, well, I wanna be a pilot. You know, I, I work around planes, that's what I wanna do. Um, so I got accepted into the ROTC program. Um, and after five years of being enlisted, they let me, let me out um, to do this and I would come right back in. And it's, um, while I was a cadet, I had, um, um, my boyfriend at the time also happened to, to be a cadet and I was, ranked number one in my class. I had actually gotten my pilot slot um, and was looking forward to uh, my time of uh, flying planes. So I had just got back in the summer, I think from um, my, um, from boot camp basically. Um, and at that time, my boyfriend said, someone, um, he was like, when you get back, someone had went in and told you know, our commander that we were gay um, and that we were in a relationship um, and so I think the first thing I did was call Service Members Legal Defense Network and, and say, um, we're hearing rumors that um, we're probably under investigation, what should I do? And at that time, there wasn't a whole lot except for don't say anything, you know, and don't sign anything until we, you know, review it. Um, and I remember being called in and being sat down and there was, you know, the JAG officer as well as an enlisted person just sitting behind me. And then the JAG officer just started saying, hey, this person has come forward and they said this about you. And I just said, I have no comment on you know, what this person said. Um, 
and just kept sticking to that. They just kept saying, well, if you don't, you know, we're just going to go by this person's word. If you don't say something. And I was like, I, at this point, I just have nothing to say. You know, I have no comment on anything that you have said to me. Um, and so, you know, I once again called SLD and just told them I, was, I didn't answer any questions. They didn't seem like they really had a lot anyways. Um, and then I just went about my business or, you know, at RTC, they just said, uh, that point, you know, I was in the leadership to help um, run all the stuff with cadets. And so it was the summer, we were preparing for the semester. Um, and so we just continued as we were going. Um, and then we were working at one of the squadrons during the summer, a handful of us got to go um, do some work and at the end shadow officers. And at the same time, we would get a, um, an incentive flight on F-15 out of it, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and so it was down to two people, uh, myself and one of my um, other cadet friends. And I was like, well, you go today, you know, tomorrow will be my, my flight um, and that'll be cool. Um, and while he was, as soon as he went to do his flight, I got a phone call and it's from our commander and he said, oh, can you just stop in, you know, the detachment and see me? And I was like, sure, you know, I can be there shortly. Um, and as soon as I came in, you know, he brought me in, sat me down, basically just hands you know, slides a piece of paper over and says, unfortunately, you know, this went up to a three-star general who decided that, you know, due to the propensity of, of you being gay, we decided, you know, we're going to have to discharge you. Um, and that's it. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> so do I need to sign anything? And he's like, yep, sign here. And I remember just walking out and he, and then the tech sergeant that worked there as well said, well, I need your ID card. I need all, you know, you need to return all your uniforms. Um, and that ended it. And so then you have to try to explain to people, everyone's trying to figure out like what happened, like why, you know, one day you're like number one in the class, you have a pilot slot, you're about to get your incentive flight. And now today you're no longer in ROTC and your career's over. Um, and I think talking to people, they were all like, oh, did you get caught cheating? You know, was it drugs? Was it, you know, like they went down all this list and I'm like, well, you know, one, I don't do any of that. So it's like, I don't do drugs. I don't, I definitely wouldn't be cheating. I mean, um, and then finally, when you tell them that, no, I was kicked out for being gay, that they were just so shocked. Um, like what, that is the reason we're kicking people out? And you're like, yep, that's the only reason. Um, and at that time, I think we didn't uh, make a big deal out of it in my, uh, my boyfriend at the time also was kicked out and both of us had decided like we didn't want you know on our at our university we didn't want to make a big deal because the rtc program was new and we knew that people would start being like let's get rid of rtc like it's horrible it shouldn't be here and we're like no the the law is horrible rtc is not horrible like you know we it, uh, we think that it provides um an opportunity for a lot of people to, you know, to become officers and that's what we want. Um, we don't want to, to get rid of it. And so then a few years later, um, SLDN calls and says, hey, we're, we, it was right after Lawrence versus Texas and said, we're looking for plaintiffs um, to challenge Joan S. Antel. Um, would you like to be a part of that? And of course I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, any opportunity to get rid of this horrible law, any opportunity to maybe go back in, um, I would love to do that. Um, and I had known, you know, known Dixon, have got to know Dixon after that. Um, and so then as that was going on, I moved to DC. Um, my, our friend Stacy, who worked at SLDN, was like, you should leave Alaska and move to DC. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And I think it was on Christmas Eve. I think I flew out and went to Texas to meet up with um, Stacy, who was a plaintiff, and, and Tommy Cook, who was the name plaintiff. And and literally drove back from Texas to DC with them. And um, right after that, um, Dixon hired me to work at SLDN. And, and so then I got the opportunity not only to be a plaintiff, but to really to work on the fight of repealing Do Don't Ask Don't Tell. And, and in reality, that's the first time I had ever um, done fundraising, actually worked, did anything with advocacy or, or the Hill. And so I got to see exactly, you know, how, well, how do you one, how did this law get here? And then two, whoa, well, how do you get rid of a law? Um, and, and, and more than rid of a law, how do you get Congress to relook at a law that they put into place and say, this was bad, it's not good for anyone and let's get rid of it. 
And, you know, and so I got the opportunity to, to, to work on that um, and got to do a lot of great things. And so then, you know, we, we got a repeal, which was uh, pretty awesome to, you know, I was at every single vote uh, um, uh, up in the chambers and got to see all that. And, and just to also get to hear all the stories. Like I remember, you know, when Joseph's story, when he was telling me about his story and we got to hear so many stories of, of one, the people that were being, that had been affected by Don't Ask, Don't Tell by being discharged, but also got to meet a lot of people that were in, you know, and so they were serving um, in the closet and they were really looking for, for this to, to be gone so that they could, that they didn't have to worry about the same things that we did of, of being kicked out. And I thought that, you know, was the most exciting part of finally seeing um, the repeal um, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Now we knew there was still a lot of stuff to, to be done that we, we hadn't dealt with the transgender issue. We had, you know, we had only focused on getting rid of, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And, and I think there's many reasons that, that uh, went into that, but um, I'm super happy that it, the policy went away. And I actually did look at that going, going back into the, the military. Of course, you know, I had been out for so many years um, at that point, but I had actually heard my knee running. I had torn a meniscus. And so um, the Air Force was like, no, <laughs> like at this point, you know, you've been out too long and with a torn meniscus, we're not, we're just not looking um, to bring anyone then that has issues, especially with the high tempo that we're going through. Um, but I looked at it from, it was an opportunity that I got the chance again to at least apply and attempt to go back in and not being said, no, you can't go because you're gay. It was because you know of of an actual real medical reason, um, and so um, I was happy about that. But um, so that's my story, and I'm glad we're celebrating this. And so now I'm going to turn it over, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fran. Thanks, David. And after hearing those stories, and uh, there are so many ways in which I could go to talk about what is the legacy of Don't Ask, Don't Tell's repeal. But I'm gonna try and be brief because I actually really want to get to your questions. And I think that's often the best part and the best conversation uh, that we can have. But I came to this panel right after attending and, and literally like, oh my God, this is running long. I better hop in an Uber and, and get home. Uh, there was a retirement at the Lincoln Memorial today of uh, Master Chief Petty Officer, uh, Dwayne B.B. Frankie. 29 years, 10 of which he got to serve openly, but it was also a celebration of this event of 10 years uh, after the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal and to see you know, some of the luminaries involved in that, who you also happen to have uh, on this panel, uh, many of them, but to see the people who then got to serve and to got to be open and authentic and reach their full potential as Undersecretary Jones was, was speaking of. The fact that we have serving general officers uh, that are out and serving well and doing amazing things is such an incredible piece of the legacy of, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, but I will touch briefly on, on my personal story and why I'm here as I am one of the senior most out uh, transgender officers uh, serving today in, in the military and, and as president of Sparta representing them and having led through the ongoing fight that happened to get transgender equality and open service in. So I don't necessarily look back at the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal as, as my holiday. Uh, and it is in a way, in many ways, it's, it's an amazing celebration. But I can certainly look back at the heroes that fought that battle, the amazing things they did to make it happen and look at it as the as a link in a long chain that stretches back well before don't ask don't tell because the same arguments thrown at lesbians gays and bisexuals were thrown against african americans they were thrown against women and then afterwards they were thrown against trans people each one became the new boogeyman to to the military and to society at large and in many cases, we got to look at smaller and smaller groups for inclusion. So it became even easier to throw those arguments because fewer and fewer people knew or thought they knew either a gay person, a lesbian, or a transgender person. And now as we talk, do you know someone who's non-binary? Do you know someone who's intersex? Did you even know they still can't serve openly and authentically? So the fight isn't over. 
to make sure that everyone in our military can serve to their full potential. Because we saw this burden lifted from so many shoulders, uh, like Joseph's and David's, where if you could have served, how much better could you have been at the time? And for the people where it was lifted off their shoulders, and they got to dedicate all this mental energy that they used to use to protect themselves, and they got to dedicate that to the mission, how much in, more incredible could they be as individuals and as members of their unit, which would make the military stronger? And so that's an interesting way in talking about how these arguments were framed, uh, where, where Dixon talked about you know, a lot of the history of don't ask, don't tell was this uh, framing of it around readiness. And could the military make it through this and be more ready for having these people serve openly. Where it had already been thought, you know, we can't do it as a, as a civil rights argument because then we'll truly be preaching to the choir. We'll only drag along certain people. We have to make it focus on the military and how they can be better uh, just by allowing these people to serve. But I wanna look at it and take that framing one evolution further and look at the opportunity cost that we have from not allowing people to serve openly, not just to serve, but as, as was mentioned, that we have people joining because these restrictions are gone, but there are still others that worry because the culture isn't perfect. And who are we missing out on? What future heroes might the military not see because they don't think it's a culture that is welcoming to them? Are we going to miss the person that revolutionizes the way we fight in cyber or in space because they thought, uh, the military won't let me be me, yet there might be otherwise perfectly capable of serving. So if we can get to that opportunity framing, not just we won't be worse, but we can be so much better, that's a thing we can all really get behind and talk about how if someone comes out to a commander in their unit, wow, what, what a cool notion because A, that person trusts that individual with that type of in information, but B, from the commander's perspective, look at it like an opportunity where this, this soldier, this Marine, this airman just came to them and said, I wanna get a degree because that's gonna make me more valuable in my job or more valuable uh, later on in my career. Look at coming out and reaching that full potential the same way. And if we can get our leadership in the military to look at it across the board as an opportunity to set the culture where people are comfortable coming out, people are comfortable reaching for the stars, that's something we can all really be proud of. Um, so uh, one quick story um, about the lessons and how, you know, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a law that we had to get repealed. As we were working for the trans ban, I happened to be a, a legislative fellow working on the Hill and in Congresswoman Bordio's office. And there was thoughts of, are we going to get a, a law that, you know, because the, the administration's considering it, will Congress put something in place to put a law banning trans service in place? And I, I was not out at the time because I would have lost my career for it. But a group of the fellows that I worked with uh, got on the topic and one of them happened to work for the, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and started asking some questions and I gave some answers. And at a certain point it came up, how do you know so much about it? And I'm like, let me tell you something. And he was only the second person other than my wife uh, that I had come out to because that was one of those moments where, hey, maybe it can make a difference. Maybe if I change this one person's perspective, he can take it back to the office and say, you know what, this might be a bad idea. Um, and I don't know how it all played out, um, although he was a wonderful neutral audience and ended up being a very big supporter of mine, but there was no law. Uh, there was no, it was only policy for us. And, uh, you know, is that harder to fight the battle within the Department of Defense or within Congress? Interesting questions uh, to figure out. But we're so excited now to be back in an era of open service. But again, the fight's not over. We have to make sure we are embracing the talents of all Americans who are otherwise qualified to serve uh, and we can continue to get better. Um, 
I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. That was really um, impressive and interesting and really brought us in a lot of different directions. Our, our attendees are being shy, but I do have a few questions. Um, a question for each of you, and I will also keep an eye on the chat box in case other attendees have questions they want to ask. Um, please, please feel free to put them in the chat box, but I'll sort of go back in order and maybe Dixon to start with you. Um, one question I had, I, 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 I was never deeply engaged on military issues, but I was working in the advocacy community and I, I had the sense that um, soldiers, uh, women and people of color may have even faced more disproportionate impact under the don't ask, don't policy, or don't, when the don't ask, don't help policy was in place, but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can speak to that, whether people who had multiple overlapping identities faced that were more likely to get investigated, more likely to get discharged, um, more likely to face harassment while they were serving. Um, or, and if, 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 if you were able to research that and understand that. Yeah, no, thanks for the question, Sean, and, and thank all the panelists. What uh, uh, amazing and incredible stories and lives you've led. Uh, don't ask, don't tell is a very intersectional issue. Uh, when uh, African-Americans uh, accounted for 30% of the armed forces, and that was reflected in the clients who got discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, women were only 13 to 15% of the armed forces, but they were disproportionately impacted at 30 to 35% of those who were kicked out under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The African-American women in that subset uh, were even more disproportionately impacted. Uh, for the Latino Latina community, we found essentially the same number of discharges as and the population as a whole, same for uh, the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Uh, the other uh, intersectionality is, is it's very much a, uh, you know, an economic issue as well. And it's one of the things that we had to do at SLDN in changing narratives. Bree mentioned one, which was uh, changing the narrative that this was about unit cohesion. This was about military readiness. It wasn't the LGBT, LGBT person who was no, the threat to unit co cohesion. It was don't ask, don't tell that was the threat to military readiness. But the other narrative that we had a challenge, and we had to challenge that within our own community, within the LGBT community, is that you know, the reason many people join our armed forces is that it's a way up and out. Uh, Lauren Huff, who was one of our clients and just wrote the New York Times bestseller, Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing, about her life growing up in a cult, and then she joined uh, the military, has said, if I'm leaving my town in Texas, uh, my option was to rise after years of hard work to rise to middle management at the Piggly Wiggly. Uh, so that is the highest I could achieve, but I could join the military and I get you know, these amazing opportunities, skills and experiences. And so we had to convince uh, not only our LGBT leadership that this was an issue that was important to people of color, to women, to uh, people who uh, were seeking economic opportunity, uh, we had to make that same point to uh, you know, members of Congress, because uh, each member got persuaded by a different point. For some, some, that was the issue. Others, it was the cost of the policy. Others, it was making the military the strongest it could be. But uh, Sean, your, your question is actually very perceptive. This was a deeply intersectional issue that we worked on. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat, which I'm going to read out loud to everybody, and then we'll have the rest of our panelists. I, I might throw in an additional question, but let me just read this directly. Um, the, the questioner says, thank you so much for your stories and advocacy. Given that there's so much developing and changing in the LGBTQ space, gender fluidity, expression, etc., what do you think is the future of LGBTQ plus inclusion and policy in the military? So I'm going to turn it back over to Joseph to kick us off. And I, you could certainly respond to that question. And I also just wanted to follow up on one other thing um, that Bree mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, like the idea of the mental energy it takes to serve in under a policy where you're threatened. I, I know from working with students in schools who can't study because they're constantly under threat. I know. It's, it's gotta be a real concern, like how much of your energy you're 
devoting to self-preservation and hiding and whether you want to reflect any more on that or or just say whether you think you know your military career it sounds like both of your careers were successful but would it have been different um presumably it would have how would it have been different if you didn't also have that on in my on your on your shoulders as well so maybe we'll start with joseph and then go through I mean, on the personal level, I, my, my childhood was difficult. My military service, uh, both services uh, were difficult. Um, I personally wouldn't change anything because I, certainly it, it, it created my adversity, my strength, my personality. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I cherish that in a way. Um, as far as how my life would have been different if I who wasn't afraid of my sexuality. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, there's really no way to put it into words, right? I mean, I was much like my peers because gay people have been arguably more often than not um, having to overcome hardship their entire lives. They are overachievers. I think we heard that thread along all the panelists today. And so, yeah, certainly um, our careers would have continued to um, contribute to the military, continue to excel, continue to rise, um, and things certainly would have been a lot easier. Um, you know, sometimes people will say, well, why do you identify as a, a gay vet rather than just a vet? And it's like, well, if, if they had criminalized heterosexuality, um, and if it had cost you your career, you would probably identify as a straight vet. Um, so, um, you know, and for a lot of us, there's lasting hurt and damage uh, or struggle, I suppose. You know, I love one thing that is a, a big tenant of, um, of, um, of one of our generals is post-traumatic growth, right? The idea that you become stronger um, through the trauma that you experience. Um, but certainly, you know, imposter syndrome and, um, and uh, impending doom. I mean, a lot of the abusive leadership that LGBT members found themselves under were often also threatened, right? We were told that we would allow a certain level of unacceptable abuse because what were we gonna do? They would end our careers. And that if we ever dared that at some point, somehow in the future, they'd, they'd get us, right? And we'd be, we'd be worse off that doesn't really shake off when you leave the military. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of hardship there. As for inclusion, um, I think that, I think the answer to that question is precisely to what Dixon um, and to what Lieutenant, I'll say Lieutenant Colonel, that's what the Marine Corps would be, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bree um, Fram mentioned. I think it would be centering us in mission readiness, right? So all of our rules should be specific to what is best for mission readiness. If that means making certain things gender neutral, if that means making things more flexible, um, if the rule isn't actually tied to something that makes unit cohesion stronger or the mission more within reach, then it's probably not, we should probably rethink that rule. Um, David, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I think I'll go with the, uh, the inclusion question first. I mean, I think the the big difference you'll see, I think even if you look at culture, LGBT culture, or just culture of the United States as a whole, and I, I think, and, and sort of get into what Joseph says, how he says he's a gay vet, or like I'll say I'm a gay vet, or even tell people that I'm gay, and this is my partner, it's right because you're making that normal. Right, because one, you're you're telling people like I'm letting you know because this is the norm, and you should already know that. Like, yes, I shouldn't have to do that, but it's not quite the norm, right? So I'm still having to do that to make it normal. But then two, it's that the younger people you're also that don't feel comfortable doing it. You're trying to show them it's comfortable. Go ahead and and do it. And and it's funny because I follow a lot of the LGBT military that are currently serving. And definitely the things that I see them post, I would have never, I, in my day, I would have been like, I would have never posted that. I probably would have never said that. And some of them are in command. You know, these are 
our commanders, the younger commanders that are moving up. And I was like, oh yeah, I would have probably never in, in my life have thought about that. But I think that's the change. And, and I think one of the things I always told people was when we got rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So in, you know, in 2011, and I was still at SLD until 2014, and everyone kept saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I'm like, we used to have to be the voice for, you know, for the, uh, the people serving. I mean, that's what, because they didn't have a voice. Once we were repealed, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they had a voice, right? I mean, that, and I was like, and they're going to be the ones to change it. I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to be the one saying this is how things should be. They're going to change it from the inside. And I think that's what they're continuing to do. And we'll see as more young people join the military, they'll be the ones that are going to be saying what, like, hey, no, why are you worrying about that? That has nothing to do with anything um, because it's about the mission. I mean, and it's, you know, that's what we have a military for a reason. People join the military for a reason and they have a mission. And I think that's what they'll focus on. And hopefully we'll be, we'll be getting away from going back and forth of, oh, we got to look at this. Um, and then from, you know, my own life, yeah, I do think, you know, getting that mental space. Um, but I felt like I was always different when I was in the military to begin with. I mean, I worked on the flight line. Um, it's different atmosphere on the flight line. I never fit in because people were like, we're going to go part of it and do this. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like, you know, like that's just not how it wasn't me. I was like, that's, I don't like, I don't talk that way. I don't think that way. Like I'm, I'm focused on, I have a job to do here and, and I want to make friends and I want to do that. But I was like, but I, I look at the world a little different and, and I think they just realized like, oh, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's who you are. And um, so I, I don't feel like I had to, you know, like, and when I actually thought, so when I had overheard a conversation where I thought the person was probably telling my command that I think he's gay and you have this problem to deal with. And I remember telling, going back and telling my boyfriend at the time, I was like, I think someone's, I think she went in and ratted us out. And so then he was like, well, that's because, because she was a horrible cadet and we were pushing and put, I was pushing of like, this is a horrible cadet you know, being prior enlisted, this is not someone anyone should have to serve under. And you guys need to address this. You can't commission people <laughs> that are this bad. Like, you know, either hold her back so she gets more leadership or something. Um, and he kept telling me, you've got to stop pushing. I was like, no, that's not who I am. Like, that's just not, <laughs> you know, like I, if, if they, you know, if I'm going to get discharged because of that, but I'm not going to, you know, not do my job because that's what I was there. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fram, I will turn it to you for your thoughts and and then we'll wrap up. No, thanks for for asking because it's a it's a beautiful question because it really does hit the two sides of this. It talks about inclusion, which is a cultural challenge for us. And it talks about policy uh, that that Joe mentioned about what are we doing from a policy perspective? because we've always done it that way. Is there a reason behind it? Is there a standard? Is there something that contributes to mission effectiveness? So for that reason, yes, we do have to go and look at policies uh, that might be gendered for no good reason. And as we go through the review of that to try and make them more inclusive uh, and to enable a more diverse force to participate fully in the military is incredibly important. Uh, on the cultural side, I am talking about opportunity again. What an exciting opportunity I have as part of a brand new service in the Space Force to look at these things and to set a culture where everyone is valued. Um, and if any of you are going to AFA, I highly encourage, listen to uh, General Raymond's speech tomorrow. And I think he's gonna hit on a ton of these topics. So when we hear it from senior leaders, uh, like our chiefs of the service or from Undersecretary Ortiz Jones, that really matters. Um, and to set that environment where you're the commander, where someone feels safe coming out to you, that's incredibly important. So there's a lot we can get into. Um, another cool thing the services are doing, uh, part of the, the barrier analysis working groups that are in the, at least the Department of the Air Force and are being looked at in other services. I know the Marines are standing up a few of them where it's groups like a women's team or an LGBTQ team, uh, one that I'm on in, in the Department of the Air Force. We're looking at adding pronouns to signature blocks because 
there's nothing that prevents us from doing so, but there's nothing that explicitly says we can. So we want to be able to set the environment where it's okay. That is a signifier that having they, them pronouns, even if there's no record that says you're either male or female, which is in the system, uh, but if you are they, and we can respect you and let you set the terms for how you are granted that dignity and respect, that's incredibly, <clears throat> excuse me, that's incredibly important to put that agency in people's hands uh, and respect them for who they are. So we can make those changes. I think we've got a great opportunity to do so coming up. Thank you so much um, to all of our panelists. This was really a tremendous conversation. I hope we can bring people back together again to talk about these issues in more depth. I feel like there's so much more to explore, but really interesting, fascinating insights. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone who joined us um, as participants um, and happy anniversary um, of, on the repeal. And thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.